In the second chapter, we'll learn how early planning practices in the late 19th and early 20th centuries served to perpetuate and worsen racial inequality. In the 1910s to 1960s, a number of public policies and planning practices were adopted to create and reinforce patterns of residential segregation and disadvantage in communities of color. There was a color line in American City. This color line was characterized by discrimination, which against immigrants and non-whites was rife in 19th and early 20th century cities. Marginalized groups were excluded from educational opportunities, political leadership, employment opportunities, and often faced segregation in public facilities. Indeed, in some states, segregation was the law. The color line also characterized social relationships. Such relationships between the races were severely restricted. For example, when the noted educator and civil rights advocate Booker T. Washington visited the White House in 1909, this caused a public uproar. Interracial marriage was illegal in 29 states as late as 1924. Racial animus also manifested in the built environment. Examples include realtors who refused to show or sell homes to black home buyers in white neighborhoods. Blacks who did buy homes in white neighborhoods often received an unwelcome response. Quite commonly, mobs would attack and bomb black home buyers in white neighborhoods. Private actions alone, however, could be insufficient for maintaining the color line across neighborhoods. White property owners could be tempted to sell to the highest bidder who might be black. And given that blacks had limited options, oftentimes they were the highest bidders. Landlords could also take advantage of the fact that black tenants had limited opportunities and charge higher rents. For those reasons, public policy came to become a tool to maintain the color line. Rapid industrialization and urbanization reinterpreted but ultimately recreated racial inequality that had existed since antebellum times. One of the first public policies that attempted to enforce racial segregation in American cities was racial zoning. This was first adopted in Baltimore in 1910 in response to an influx of Blacks into the city. The law stipulated that Blacks could not move onto majority white blocks and whites could not move onto majority Black blocks. This practice was adopted by several dozen southern cities. This type of zoning was challenged by the NAACP and was ultimately ruled unconstitutional by the Supreme Court in 1917 in the case Buchanan v. Worley. Such zoning was ruled unconstitutional because it denied the property rights of owners who should be able to sell to whom they chose, or so the court reasoned. Subsequent to racial zoning, a number of other public policies were implemented that served to disadvantage African Americans and other people of color who were moving to the cities. After the Great Migration began in the 1910s, Black neighborhoods began to form due to the previously described forces. Banks were often reluctant to lend in these neighborhoods. But during the New Deal era in the 1930s, when the federal government took steps to resuscitate the housing industry, federal agencies such as the Home Owners Loan Corporation or the Federal Housing Authority created color-coded maps to identify neighborhoods suitable for lending. Black neighborhoods were often deemed too risky and coded red, hence the term redlining. These policies institutionalize the practice of starving predominantly African American neighborhoods of credit. During the New Deal era and after World War II, slum clearance, which later became known as urban renewal, aimed to replace slums and replace 
them with decent, affordable housing. While the intentions were good, oftentimes black neighborhoods were disproportionately targeted. Even black neighborhoods that had decent housing already were oftentimes targeted for urban renewal. Many of these communities had strong social ties and solid business communities that were ultimately destroyed. Many of the existing housing units were not unsalvageable and could have been maintained and rehabilitated. Fewer affordable housing units were created than destroyed. So common was the practice of targeting black neighborhoods that urban renewal was sometimes referred to as Negro removal. Public housing was another program that was well-intentioned. However, in its implementation, there were problems. From the beginning, developments were segregated with black developments built and tenanted by black tenants in black neighborhoods and white developments were built and tenanted by whites in white neighborhoods. Public housing in general was not adequately funded. Consequently, it was not well maintained in many instances, and this housing often turned into public slums. As a result, the program served to, in many instances, exacerbate patterns of segregation and poverty concentration. The interstate highway system was a policy that, at first glance, might appear to be race neutral. It was built after World War II to facilitate interstate travel and mobility for the armed forces. The planning and routing of these highways, however, paid little attention to the social fabric of the community in and along the routes. Neighborhoods were often torn asunder and their social networks disrupted. Low income and communities of color bore the brunt of the ill-routed highways. Zoning, which we mentioned earlier, was adapted not just to explicitly exclude Blacks, once that was ruled unconstitutional in 1917, other means were used or developed to use zoning to separate people by class and ultimately by race. Both building codes and zoning can be used to promote the general welfare of communities, but they often exclude and displace low income and minority populations. For example, zoning that prohibits multifamily housing or requires large lots results in exclusion of low income and, as a result, minority households who tend to have lower incomes. Building codes can be enforced selectively, and when done in a very stringent manner, building codes and the use of condemnation can be used to evict undesirable populations, such as in the case of Mount Laurel, when the town tried to evict a pre-existing Black community by strictly enforcing building code. 